The lack of structure in boxing almost forces you to follow the hype. Example, Fury beats Wilder twice. We all know he won the fight, was scored a draw. But let's just call it what it is. He scored two wins over Wilder. So from 2020 to now, Fury beats Wilder twice, takes his WBC strap, defends against him once. AJ loses his straps, his unified straps, to Alexander Yusek. And he loses the rematch. All of a sudden, Tyson Fury would mop the floor with Anthony Joshua. Joshua looks washed. Killer instinct gone. To the majority, Wilder seemed to salvage more credibility out of his two losses than Joshua did his two losses. They were saying Wilder was still sparked Anthony Joshua. They were saying shit like Joe Joyce would knock Anthony Joshua out. Although Joshua knocked him out as an amateur and has a better pro resume. Then all of a sudden... Fury. Oh, he catches him off guard! Francis Ngannou has just scored a knockdown against the heavyweight champ! Anything can happen! Left hook over the top of Fury's right hand. A counter punch puts Tyson Fury down. Fury is not able to manhandle Ngannou like he manhandled Deontay Wilder. He's not able to contain Nganu like he did Dillian or Derek Chisora. Nganu goes the distance. Fury's reduced to using elbows. Fury wins a split decision. Nganu wins the big moral victory. All of a sudden, Yusek's going to destroy this guy. And let's not forget, a few months before that, when Yusek was floored by the borderline shot that Daniel Dubois landed, the body shot, and he got back up to win. A lot of people were saying he was damaged goods as well. But Tyson basically won a split decision and lost a moral victory against the guy making his pro debut as a boxer, an MMA fighter. And it's probably going to drastically shift the odds with the bookmakers when he meets Alexander Yusek in Riyadh in February. At the start of the year, a lot of the social media who cover boxing and fans were saying that Joe Joyce and Deontay Wilder would both stretch Anthony Joshua. Are they saying that now? No. Joyce got beaten twice, knocked out once, and Deontay Wilder lost a big upset. They're saying Deontay's shot. They're saying, oh, Joyce relies on his chin too much. And then they stay with the day of reckoning. Wilder loses to someone who Joshua UD'd in a unification years back. Wow. AJ smashes a contender who took Fury the distance and nearly got a cut eye stoppage win against and gave him a very stiff test and AJ made easy work of it. Now all of a sudden AJ's that dude again. Now what I'm saying is in the last four years or so Wilder's been written off, Fury's been written off, Usyk's been written off, AJ's been written off, Joyce has been written off, Joseph Parker he's been written off, Daddy Dubois he's been written off and how much of them fighters I just mentioned redeemed themselves on the day of reckoning? And Joshua's name is restored without fighting Tyson Fury, without fighting Deontay Wilder. And this is a big issue with boxing and will continue to be. Yes, it was a great weekend for Joshua because his common opponent with Deontay Wilder, Parker, upset Wilder on the night without much issues. And then AJ's common opponent with Tyson Fury, Otto Wallin. Wasn't even a good sparring session for Anthony Joshua. It wasn't even good sparring. We were wrong to assume that Joseph Parker would just crumble in front of Deontay Wilder. Joseph is a former champion who took on harder fights in his 20s on the come up than Wilder did in his 20s. And it should be a good um, lesson that for one, this is not a golden era of boxing. It's not. And I'm talking about golden era for the heavyweights. The fact we're having debates like, look what A did to B, but couldn't do to C. To try and assess the positions of who's the best heavyweight. We're still doing that in 2023. And the fighters, you know, they're not fighting three or four times a year. When Fury was saying that no one else can beat Deontay Wilder except him. There's a load of nonsense and a lot of the media bought into that. Like, those who just wrote off Anthony Joshua against Deontay Wilder without looking at Deontay's resume thoroughly and his skill set 
maybe he would beat him because the fights never happened. Those who compared Fury to any consensus top 10 all time great heavyweights is too premature. To summarize my position on this, Andy Ruiz beats Anthony Joshua. Deontay Wilder's walking around like he beat Anthony Joshua. Oh, this is why Joshua didn't want to fight. You see what would have happened to him? But he's never fought Anthony Joshua. It's not a good road we're going down. Thankfully, February, we get an undisputed fight between Yusek and Fury. Hopefully both men make it into the ring healthy. And thanks to the Saudi Arabian money, things could be changing. If they're going to put the money forward, the networks and promoters outside of Saudi Arabia, they cannot be holding their fighters back from taking such golden opportunities to earn more than what they've ever earned. Somebody in the comment section of one of my recent videos said, the Day of Reckoning beats was like a clean out. Let's see who can fight and who can't. And he had a point. You know, Jarrell Miller and Wilder got caught slipping. Mutmadov, he got caught slipping. And I'm not saying they're finished, but let's put out that money, entice them into that ring, and see what they're all about. Now, I believe um, Jarrell Miller used to do kickboxing, and there was a Peds charge mentioned. I don't know nothing about it, I haven't done no research. Now, he knocked out Thomas Adamic in one round. This was on the back of outpointing Johan Duharpus. Both fights were in America, co-promoted by Eddie Hearn Matrum and Dimitri Salita. Now Eddie will admit it, at this stage here, 2018, the PED issue was a problem in boxing, but let's face it, promoters weren't pushing the budget to test stringently. And Miller's throwing 80 punches around and people are talking about this guy. He's beat the likes of Gerald Washington, Marius Wack, Stop Bogdan Dinu after the Adamic fight. But let's focus on the Adamic fight. He goes to Adamic's dressing room post-fight after knocking him out. It was a bad beating. And he's crying his eyes out. Sorry, man. I'm sorry. I mean, I don't know if he sparred him. Maybe he sparred him. I was thinking, why is he crying like that? But anyway, that's November 2018. Fast forward. 2019, he gets a shot at the unified heavyweight champion, Anthony Joshua. Testing positive for three banned substances, GW1516, HGH, and EPO. Before he got popped, he was keen to try and convince everybody that AJ had these testosterone exemptions. There's no way nobody could have made the gains that AJ made physically from when he was an amateur to when he's a pro. Then he himself popped for all them substances. He violently pushed AJ at one of the press conferences. And I'm thinking to myself, there's something not right with Jerome Miller. And when I made my prediction for the fight, I predicted for him to either get DQ'd or to pop dirty. And I've never did that before. And he popped dirty for three different substances. Fight cancelled. $10 million purse blown. Anyway, he's banned for a couple of years. Top rank sign him. First fight, Jerry Forrest. He pops dirty again. Oops, I did it again. And he's not able to get back in the ring until June last year. Three wins, one over Lucas Brown. He gets a big opportunity at the Day of Reckoning card. He's stringently tested. And apparently it doesn't look like he took anything. Because this is VADA testing. Yeah? Gets battered by Daniel Dubois, stopped in the last round. To be fair to the guy, I'm not a big fan, but I had to admire his gameness and his durability. He didn't make no excuses, just took a good old fashioned ass whooping. The fight was competitive though, it was a war, it was a really good fight. Once again, you know, pre fight, running his mouth on Anthony Joshua, blah 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 blah. He threatens to pull up on Eddie Hearn. To get someone to pull up on Eddie Hearn actually threatens him. And the cameras are everywhere. He pushes Dubois violently pre-fight at the weigh-in. I believe it was the final presser before he fought Dubois. He took time to have a go at his promoter, Dimitri Salita. I started steaming into him. Dimitri Salita has issues with Jermaine Franklin as well, which he's going to court. Miller was saying as soon as his contract is up, he's walking away. He said that 
Sinita's not going to get paid off his blood. He's had basically no financial assistance from Salita, and he's mad. Salita's suing him for five million for loss of potential purses when Jarrell is popped for PEDs. Before he fights Dubois, he takes a Shahada, he becomes a Muslim in Saudi Arabia. There's tears and everything, and it's emotional. I'm making this profile of the guy. Why was he crying in Adamek's dressing room? Well, more than likely, he felt calmer that he took whatever substances and beat the crap out of him and could have killed him. And, and you know, this is a sport, you know, one time's up and down, <laughs> it is. Therefore, most important, I'm healthy, you're healthy, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, good, you know. We are your support, we are your fans, we are your fans from tonight. God, God bless you. You got 5,000 more fans. God bless you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Bye. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Human being. And then, you know, you're mad with Joshua, you're mad with this guy, then you're smiling and joking, you threaten Eddie Hearn in front of cameras, then you're crying at the Shahada. He's bouncing around everywhere. He can't get no consistency in his mood patterns at all. No one's happy all the time and no one's sad all the time, but this guy here. Again, I said I was a time bomb. I discovered this new channel, British channel, and he's very good. And I like the way he ended this video about Gerald Miller, the bully getting bullied. Yeah. Uh, was that always the plan? Yeah, finish strong. I didn't want to just rest on a point victory. I wanted to finish him, and the opportunity was there, and I had to take it. Uh, what do you make of Gerald Miller as an opponent? You know, he's my friend for life now. Yeah, what did, what did... No, 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 Daniel. Don't be naive. Stay away from toxicity. Acquaintance? Yes. Friend? No. His brain is everywhere. Like, he might believe there's unfinished business with Anthony Joshua, but Joshua didn't take the bag away from Miller. He shouldn't have been focused on Anthony Joshua at all. Joshua didn't say nothing to him. You know, he smacked talk Daniel Dubois, and that's fair game. That's who he's fighting. But, you know, you go from AJ to Dubois to Eddie Hearn, for a few shots at Wilder, but you know, he seemed like he was sucking up to Wilder. Then his promoter, take a Shahada, get beaten up in the boxing ring, and between everything I'm saying, you know, he's mad, cursing people out, then he's bussing jokes. I'm just thinking, it must be exhausting being Jarrell Miller, mentally, but he's probably used to it. Then he gets back to Florida on some chokehold carjacking charge. That's crazy, like. He must have stopped making the payments on his vehicle. He takes a female to the dealership. The female tells the employee that she left her phone in the vehicle. He brings the key and Miller blindsides him, chokeholds him, throws him on the floor, takes the keys, takes the vehicle, which has a tracking device in it. I mean, it's, I mean, it's just the final straw. He's locked up in Broward County in Florida right now. And that's where he needs to be. He needs to cool out and think about it. Stop, stop. Think for a moment, okay? All right, massive breaking news on this Friday evening from the world of combat sports. I have confirmed via Mr. Turkey Al Al Sheikh that it is a done deal. It is going down. Francis Ngannou, le predateur, the former UFC heavyweight champion is returning to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Of course, just a few months removed from his incredible performance against Tyson Fury after an unbelievable year where he leaves the UFC, he signs with PFL, and then he gets the big Tyson fight and shocks everyone. He is returning to action in a boxing match later on this year to go up against the former heavyweight champion, the man who had an incredible 2023 in his own right, the man who just won at Day of Reckoning on December 23rd in Riyadh, the one and only A.J. Anthony Joshua. It is a done deal on both ends. Anthony Joshua versus Francis Ngannou. 10-round fight later on this year in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I've confirmed this via Mr. Turkey Al Sheikh and my own sources. And there is going to be a press conference, I'm told, later on this month in London to officially announce the date. But it is going down. It is done. 
Francis versus AJ. The Francis boxing journey continues, and now he goes up against the former heavyweight champion, Anthony Joshua, who just beat Otto Valin. Tremendous stuff. More to come. Stay tuned. I'm guessing a lot of the press and media are ditching the stories they were planning to print, and this is what they're going to be talking about now. Anthony Joshua versus Francis Ngannou is now a done deal for a 10-round boxing match to take place in Saudi Arabia. His Excellency Turkey al Sheik has confirmed, date to be confirmed, at a press conference in London this month. Now it's going to have its critics and it's going to have its curiosity seekers. The critics are going to be asking why he's not fighting Hergovic, why he's not fighting Zhang. And at the same time, Ngannou is ranked number 10 by the WBC on the strength of pushing Tyson Fury to a split decision and decking him. And it's a fight that all the other guys you're saying, why isn't AJ fighting them? Like Zhang, Hergovic, they would have all took the fight if they could get it. Wilder would have took it, but obviously he fumbled the bag. And AJ stepping up. Now he said he's planning to fight four times this year, Anthony Joshua. It's an ambitious goal. I'm not sure if he'll hit that. But... You know, if he's fighting four or three times a year, then to me, it's not a big issue fighting Ngannou. If you're going to fight once for the year and you're a champion like Tyson Fury and your one fight was against Ngannou was an unproven quantity at that time, then it is a bit of an issue, especially if we're waiting for an undisputed fight between Fury and Yusek. But Joshua doesn't have a belt. A fight with Hagovic for the vacant IBF belt, that's a little way off at the moment. I don't have a problem with it. I think it will become a problem if AJ struggles like Fury struggled with Ngannou. But if he can do a clean job, push him aside, then move on to the quote-unquote serious business of wheel boxes and belts, then it's not an issue. He's keeping active and let's not bullshit around. Whether the Ngannou fight replaces the March the 9th date that the Wilder fight was supposed to be on, it's a truckload of money for Ngannou and Anthony Joshua and Eddie Hearn and Frank Warren and anyone else who's got their hand in the cookie jar. Now Ngannou is a very physically imposing dude and I'm not doing a fight breakdown right now but he's a big strong dude. He's a unit and Joshua you know he's got to stay on point because of that. He's fighting someone who's just as strong as he is. But as for Ngannou walking forward and trying to counter punch Anthony Joshua it's not like he has the hand speed of an Andy Ruiz or anything like that. He won't be able to get out of the way of AJ's punches and he won't be trying to get out of the way. A lot of the times when he was beating up Fury, he was ignoring Fury's feints and just walking through him and just throwing hands. So it should be exciting. So I, I, I don't foresee the fight to be much issues for Anthony Joshua. I don't. You know, Ngannou doesn't have the element of surprise like he had on Tyson Fury. He doesn't have none of that going for him and it's his second pro fight. We can't expect too much from him. I'm not sleeping on the fight. It would be interesting to see what undercard they put together on this one. Almost as interesting as the main event, in all truth. And I think a few of the winners from the Day of Reckoning, they're going to be saying, well, is it winner stays on? Because with the purses, there won't be no withdrawals unless they're literally on death's door. This is prize fighting. They say AJ earned around £10 million pounds for bashing up. Otto well in some sources say it was a little lower but that's huge money for a non-title fight you know what I mean Wallin made about a million that's a great purse he only earned 200k for the Tyson Fury fight Linda Arthur 500k like you might be saying well 500k in a lot no 500k is a big purse for Linda Arthur huge purse do the research yourself show me how much IBO champions are making 500k for their last or next fight. He's not making that kind of money on Channel 5, trust me. We've got a domestic showdown at Light Heavy coming soon. Boatsy versus Aziz. It'll be interesting to see what their purses are compared to Linden's. Bivol, who defeated Linden, 1.9 million dollars. It's good money, it's good money. It's nowhere near the 5 million against Canelo, but he's fighting Linden Arthur. It's good money. And I think Wilder made about roughly what AJ made. He just had to take a back seat on the A side main event position. That's all. So yeah, Wilder was over there. You know what I mean? Even though he wasn't fit, but he was over there because of the bag. 
prize fighting. A lot of people will disapprove. AJ versus Ngannou. I expect to see comments that are not in favour of that fight. And some who will be in favour. And I'll be interested to hear what you guys have got to say. You know, some people are going to accuse Joshua of chasing the bag. But the belts are tied up. Fury and Yusek have a two-way rematch clause. They're splitting a pot of up to 121 million. And Tyson still has to give Ukraine a million as part of the deal. I think he gets the lion's share of the split. 70% or so.